Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve as he concludes his new series entitled Fake News, Exposing the Lies of the Devil. In today's lesson, he'll explain how you can be sure that hell is real and that it's populated and it's completely avoidable. The message is called The Real Inconvenient Truth. I want to talk today about a subject that so many people don't talk about in church, don't want to talk about, but it's a subject that we need to talk about. Pastor of the largest church in America, largest congregation in America, church will use that term loosely, but the largest congregation in America was asked point blank not too long ago, do you ever preach on hell? He said, no, I don't ever preach on hell. They said, why not? He said, because I don't want to make people feel bad. I want to make people feel good. People already know that they're doing bad, so why do I want to come and talk to them about hell? And so he never talks about it. You know, the preacher that talked the most about hell was the one who loved the most, and that preacher was Jesus. Jesus spoke about hell often in his sermons. As a matter of fact, Jesus spoke about twice as much on hell as he did on heaven. Why is that? Because he doesn't want anyone to go to hell. Hell is a terrible, horrible place. And the subject of hell and divine rep uh, retribution is a subject that is sorely needed in our world today. As one preacher said, if the pulpits in America spent more time talking about hell, the streets in America wouldn't see so much hell practiced out in public. And that is true. Winston Churchill said this about the time of 1960. He said, the moral landslide in Great Britain can be traced back to the fact that heaven and hell are no longer proclaimed in the land. And that's the world we live in today. That was true in 1960, how much more so in our world today? Well, this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 4. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, Fear him. We live in a world today where people don't fear God and they don't fear hell. They don't hear about hell, so they're not very concerned about hell. And although the surveys show that the majority of people in America, more than 50% of the people in America, believe that there is this place called hell, they don't think they're going there. More of them believe in heaven. You know, the big uh, book and movie that came out, Heaven is for Real. I mean, people, they love that book and they wanted to see that movie. How do you think it would work if I wrote a book called Hell is for Real? They probably wouldn't do a movie on it because it'd be like, ah, we don't want to talk about that. We don't think about that. Uh, that's just, uh, you know, that's not going to sell. Nobody's going to come to hear that. But the truth of the matter is there. So what does the Bible say about a place called hell? And I want you to know up front, there are three objectives in this message. Objective number one is to open our eyes to truth. Because as I said, most places you don't hear the, the preacher talk about hell. So you may not know very much about hell. So objective number one, to open our eyes to truth. Objective number two is if you are not ready to face God, if you are one heartbeat away from hell, that today would be the day that you settle it with the Lord and that you receive his free gift of salvation. And objective number three, that those of us who know Jesus and love Jesus, that we'd have a burden in our hearts 
for people who aren't ready. Because see, if we're not thinking about hell, if we're not thinking about what is uh, awaiting the person who dies without Christ, then we're not motivated to share Christ with them. Jesus saves us, but he saves us from what? He saves us from the penalty of our sins, and the penalty of sin is found in hell. So what does the Bible tell us about hell? Three discoveries that I want to share with you today. Discovery number one, hell is a real place. It's a real place. It's not a figment of someone's imagination. It's not a concoction of some evangelist who's trying to scare people so he can get them uh, into walking the aisle or making decisions. Hell is a real place. It's a real place. And Jesus believed in it. And Jesus talked about it. And Jesus preached on the horrors of it. So this real place, what is it like there in hell? Four characteristics of hell. Four particulars of the place called hell. Particular number one, hell is a place of eternal fire. Eternal fire. That's how Jesus described it. Mark chapter 9, he says this, and if your hand causes you to stumble, stumble, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life crippled than to having two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. It's the unquenchable fire. He also called it eternal fire. He called it the furnace of fire. He called it the lake of fire. Those are all terms of the uh, adjectives of the same place. That's what hell is. It is fire. The rich man in Luke 16 who died and went to Hades, which is not hell. Hades is kind of like county jail. Hell is the state pen. Hades is where you go because, hey, I committed the crime, but I have to stand before the judge one day, and that day is not yet. Hades is no fun and games. It's similar to hell, but it's not the final hell. But the man in Luke 16, he died, and he went to Hades, and he confessed, I am in agony in this flame. Now, the Greek word for hell that's used in Luke, it's also used there in Mark, is the Greek word Gehenna. It was a place known in the Old Testament as the Valley of Hinnom, H-I-N-N-O-M. And in Hebrew, they would call that Gehinnom. So from Gehinnom in Hebrew, we get Gehenna in the Greek. And it was an area southwest of Jerusalem that was a very skinny little valley, a little glen that was deep. And it was there in the Old Testament, some of the ungodly kings, they would sacrifice their sons and their daughters to the false god Molech. And that god, would they would give their sons and daughters in the fire to that god. Well, that was a, an abhorrent practice in Israel. And when Josiah, good king Josiah, took the throne, he did away with that. And then the valley of Hinnom was no longer a place of child sacrifice. It became the city dump. And at the city dump in Israel, that's where they would burn the refuse. And so when Jesus called hell Gehenna, the people knew that's the place where the fire never goes out. Because 24-7, there was a fire there in the valley of Hinnom to burn the refuse of the city. That was the garbage dump. That's where you took all your trash, and it burned forever. Hell is a place of eternal fire. Sometimes you hear people and they say, uh, they just kind of laugh and mock the idea of hell, and they say, well, you know, I want to go to hell. All my friends are going to be there. We're going to sit around and play poker. How many people do you know play poker in a blast furnace? Me neither. And because it's a place of eternal death, it's a place of everlasting despair. You don't ever have a good day in hell. Never anything to look forward to in hell. Every day worse than the day before. Somebody as well said, over the portals of hell are written these words, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. That's a horrible place. Why did Jesus talk about hell? Because hell's a real place and he doesn't want anybody to go there. He didn't want anybody to go there. But people do go there. It's not only a real place, hell is a populated place. A populated place. Now remember this about hell. God created hell 
It says in Matthew chapter 25, for the devil and his angels. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, Jesus said, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why did God make hell? For the devil and his angels. Now, if you follow in the footsteps of the devil and his angels, you're going to end up where the devil and his angels are in hell. And Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 7, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and many are those who enter by it. But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Based on that scripture, Matthew chapter 7, the majority of people, the many are on the broad road that leads to destruction. Few are on the narrow road that leads to life. So hell is a populated place. Revelation chapter 21, the Lord is speaking, and he's talking about the eternal state, and he's talking about the wonders of heaven that his servants will see his face. And he says in verse 7, he who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What's the common denominator of everyone mentioned in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8? See, not everyone is a murderer. Not everyone is immoral. Not everyone is a sorcerer. Not everyone is an idolater. Not everyone is a liar. Not everyone is an abominable, abominable person. Not everyone is cowardly. But everyone is guilty of the sin of unbelief. That's the only people that go to hell are those who won't believe in Jesus. They believe in themselves or they believe in their doctrine or they believe in something else. They believe in some false God. They're unbelievers when it comes to Jesus. Jesus said this in John chapter 3, verse 18. He who believes in him, speaking of the Son, is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Listen, there is one remedy for sin. Not two, not three, not four, not ten. One. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And you can't get there. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the only way. So hell is a populated place. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many of those who are on the broad road, narrow is the road that leads to life, and few there be that find it. But here's the good news. The good news. Hell is an avoidable place. It's a real place, real terrible, horrible place. It's a populated place, but it's an avoidable place. Good news right here. No one has to go to hell. No one has to go to hell. The Lord doesn't want people to go to hell. It's an avoidable place. John 3.16 has been called the gospel in a nutshell. It's probably one of the most familiar verses in all of the Bible. People that don't know much of the Bible, they're, they're familiar with John 3.16. They may not know exactly what it says, but they see it a lot. You know, I think it was Tim Tebow that put it under his, his eye black and he put John 3.16 there. And you see it at ball games and things like that. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And verse 17, for God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. God looked down at the world, going the way of Adam and Eve, turning against God, not obeying God, going in their own way. As the scripture says in Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray, each one has turned to his own way. You know, sin is not necessarily shaking your fist in the face of God and saying, I will not follow you and you're not big enough to make me follow you. Sin is just doing your own thing. It's just neglecting God. It's just saying, yeah, yeah, I'll see, maybe later I'll, I'm going to do my own thing. It's, it's the picture of the prodigal son who said, see you, Dad, I'm going to go uh, find my own way. That is sin. And God saw that we were wandering aimlessly and going after our own thing, and he sent his son. 
He said, these people are perishing. And I don't want them to perish because I don't want anyone to go to hell. And so I'm gonna send my son and my son will be the sacrifice for their sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, watch it, should not perish. Should not perish. What does that tell you? That tells you that you're perishing, that I'm perishing, that we're perishing. Apart from Christ, we're all perishing. You know, some people get the idea that, well, that, you know, this, this idea of hell, you know, I don't believe that a loving God would ever send anyone to hell, and I don't believe that God uh, would ever create a hell, and, you know, if the Supreme Court of the United States of America could vote on it, they would outlaw hell as cruel and unusual punishment, but they can't vote on it. It's not given uh, for them to vote, and so people say, well, I don't understand that. It just doesn't uh, wash with a good God. But what they don't see is that every single person comes into this world and they're perishing. They come into this world with a, a disease called sin. And that sin is going to kill them and separate them from God forever. And if God doesn't intervene, that's what's going to happen. They're on the broad road and it leads to destruction. And that's where everyone is going. And if God doesn't do anything, that's what happens. But so what does God do? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God says, I'm gonna put a cross right in the middle of the broad road, and if a man, a woman, a boy, or girl ends up going to hell, they'll have to trip over the cross of Jesus Christ to get there. Here's the good news. If you come to Jesus, you will never go to hell. If you come to Jesus, you will never go to hell. What did Jesus come to do? To save us. To save us from what? From our sins. You shall call his name, the angel said to Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. What does sin do? Sin kills and sends you to hell. That's what sin does. The soul that sins shall surely die. The wages of sin is death. But if you come to Jesus, he'll take your sin away. And you don't have to deal with that. Jesus would look out on the crowd and say, come to me, come to me, come to me. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. Come to me. And the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, it says this in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let those who hear this say, come. Let those who are thirsty come. Let those who want the water of life take it as a gift. The water of life without cost. Come, come, come. You can come to him. And if you come to Jesus, you will never go to hell. But now watch this. If you reject Jesus, if you neglect Jesus, if you blow him off, all that's left for you is hell. All that's left for you is hell. Why? Because you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Now, the Lord said in Luke chapter 12, verse 5, that we're to fear him who has authority to cast into hell. And he does have authority to cast into hell. But I want you to notice this. God does not really send anyone to hell. You send yourself to hell. You send yourself to hell. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if you end up in hell, it's because you rejected God and his sacrifice and his plan for your life. You're on the broad road and you saw the cross and you just stepped aside and kept on going to the way of destruction. And then you're going to turn around and blame God for sending you to hell. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed and he sweat blood. And remember, the cup kept coming to him. And he didn't want to drink the cup because it was the cup of all the sin of all the world, all your sin, all my sin, all the sin that has ever been committed, concentrated, boiled down in that cup. And he was supposed to drink that cup and he didn't want to drink that cup. And he prayed three times, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Did you know when you read in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment, 
where all the unbelievers come before Jesus and they're judged, every single one of them, and they're cast into the lake of fire. Do you know what Jesus says to every single person who comes before him? Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. My will was that you would have been saved. My will was that you would have responded to me, but you said no. You didn't want me. So now all that's left for you is hell. G.K. Chesterton, the great philosopher and theologian, said this, hell is God's great compliment to the reality of human freedom. You don't want me? I gave you the freedom to choose. You don't want to choose me? Well, not my will, but yours be done. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of the reign of Antichrist, and it talks about his deception, and it says these words, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Why do people perish? Because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And it says that they may be damned and they may be judged. Why? Who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. Here's the decision that is before every single person. To receive Christ or reject Christ. To crown him or crucify him to surrender to him or blow him off and do my own thing, and the pull to saying no to Jesus is my sin. Is my sin. They, what does it say there? It says that they did not believe the love of the truth so as to be saved, but they took pleasure in wickedness. And they said, well, if I choose Jesus, then I can't have my drugs. I can't have my sexual immorality. I can't have my pride. I can't have my this. I can't have my that. I'd have to give that up for Jesus. And what a lost person says who rejects Christ is, I'd rather have my sin than God's son. They did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved, but they took pleasure in wickedness. And God says, not my will, but yours be done. Three objectives, that you'd know the truth, that hell is a horrible, awful place, and that's where the majority of this world is going without Jesus. Second objective, that you would do what the Scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Are you trusting in yourself, or are you really and truly trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation? And I would say to you today, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears come, and let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost come. Today is the day for you to come. And then objective number three, that we would have a burden for people who don't know Christ, that we would want to see them come, that we would cry tears for lost family members and friends and people we work with and people we live next door to that don't know Jesus and we've never talked to them about Jesus and they're one heartbeat away from hell that we'd have a broken heart for them. Would you let God take this message and do a work in your heart? We've been talking about fake news today. We've been exposing the lies of the devil. And as we close out this message, we want to focus on the truth that God really does love you. Jesus really did die for you. And you can be forgiven and changed if you want to be. So if that's your desire, pray this simple prayer with me. Just say from your heart, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself, but I believe Jesus that you are God in the flesh, that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose from the dead on the third day. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my life, my all to you, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. 
please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. Today's message, The Real Inconvenient Truth, is available in multiple formats when you call 877-777-6171 or go online to fromhisheart.org. This message is also one of eight in Pastor Jeff Shreve's new series called Fake News, Exposing the Lies of the Devil. Here again is Pastor Jeff. I have some exciting news. A generous supporter has stepped forward with a $50,000 matching grant. Now that means that any gift you give by April 30th will be doubled up to $50,000. This comes at a great time because our world is in terrible trouble. People want answers to the mess we're in, and hey, those answers are found in Jesus. Now as we as a ministry lift up the Lord and preach His Word without any apology or compromise, we give people the opportunity to come to know Christ in a real way, a way that changes their lives. And to thank you for your generous response, I'd like to send you my new teaching series on the book of Galatians entitled, Do You Want to Be Free? It's a verse-by-verse study of this great little book. I'm praying it'll be a blessing to you. Thanks again for being a double blessing to From His Heart in April. As Pastor Jeff has said, if given by April 30th, your gift will be matched, in essence, doubled with this special matching grant challenge. And we'll say thanks by sending you, Do You Want to Be Free? A new 16-message verse-by-verse study of the book of Galatians. Call 877-777-6171 or simply go online to fromhisheart.org. And thank you for being a double blessing to those around the world who'll hear the good news through From His Heart Ministries. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth.